Good evening. I can see we've got around 26 attendees. Um, we are expecting over 200 people who have registered for tonight. So I'm just going to give you an extra minute for a few more people to join, and then I'm going to start tonight's proceedings. I'm looking forward to this tonight's conversation. Um, we'll just let a few more minutes, a few seconds pass and see who else joins us. Joining at a great pace now, 31 attendees. I know lots of you are finishing your busy days and what a great way to spend your evening. I hope some of you have poured a glass of wine um, and I'm going to get started now. Good evening. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you to tonight's webinar where we are focusing on very important subjects that affect primary care and vaccine immunizers. Tonight, we will focus on the health technology assessment process, what it is, and the opportunity for participants on this webinar to contribute to the assessment process and help drive change in access to vaccines and other important medicines and treatments. My name is Liz de Soma, and I am the CEO of Medicines Australia, which is the industry peak body for the pharmaceutical industry. I'm also the industry representative on the government's HTA Review Reference Committee. But for this meeting, my primary role is on behalf of Medicines Australia, and our discussion will focus on opportunities for advancing timely patient access to vaccines in the interests of public health. Before I introduce you to our two panellists, I would just like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting. In the spirit of reconciliation, the Immunisation Coalition and Medicines Australia would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands on which we meet and throughout Australia and recognize their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respect to elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and those of you who may be joining us today. Well, joining me tonight are two distinguished general practitioners. So I'm going to introduce them to you now and then you will meet them later after I've given you a little bit of a, a background briefing on the health technology assessment review process. Firstly, Dr. Rodney Pierce. Rod is a country and city GP and medical officer of health for the Eastern Health Authority in Adelaide. He's the director medical for the Benevolent Association South Australia and is the current chair of the Immunisation Coalition and is a past member of ATAGI. Welcome to Rod. Secondly, Dr. Leanne Jones. Dr. Jones is a general practitioner at the Windmill Hill Medical Center in Launceston and a director of the Immunization Coalition. She's, she's a GP with more than 35 years experience and has an in-depth knowledge of the health issues facing Tasmanians. Firstly, just a bit of, bit of housekeeping. We really welcome your input into tonight's discussion and really encourage you to ask questions. We please ask you to use the Q&A function to send through your questions, and we will do our best to moderate and answer as many as possible. The format tonight is that I will give an overview of the history of health technology assessment, the assessment process, why it's important to provide expert input into the review process, and then we will hear from Drs. Pierce and Jones, and who will describe two examples, one on the shingles vaccine and the other on the meningococcal B vaccine. We will end with a group discussion and then open the meeting to an online Q&A. So let's get started. I'm going to be sharing my screen. So um, I think that uh, subject to technical difficulties, I'll be with you in just a second. Hoping you can all see those slides um, and I will get started. Firstly, just to give you a little bit of health technology assessment review process background. 
The Health Technology Assessment Review has emerged out of the signing of an agreement between Medicines Australia and the Commonwealth Government, but it doesn't sit in isolation of other important things that have happened in our healthcare area in the last 12 to 24 months. In 2021, uh, there was a strong call from industry, from patient groups, from clinicians and from a number of stakeholders to review Australia's national medicines policy. And this is partly because the national medicines policy has not really kept pace with the rapid advances in medical technologies and was not necessarily fit for the future. Um, so after that, the former government, which was the coalition government, initiated a review of the national medicines policy. It was finalized under the current government, the Labour government, and has a really strong vision for how we see access to medicines um, supporting public health and incorporating some flexibility for new technologies and technologies that may not even have emerged as yet, but with a strong focus on patients and patient access to medicines and quality use of medicines. At the same time, the government initiated a House of Representatives inquiry into access of, to new drugs and novel technologies. This review ended up in over 30 recommendations, which focus very strongly on how do patients get access to new technologies and new drugs, and whether our systems are fit for purpose, whether they be access to rare diseases, to vaccines, to new technologies, to blood products, cell and gene therapies, and that intersection between the state and territories. And then the final piece of this puzzle was the Health Technology Assessment Policy and Methods Review, which came out of Medicines Australia's strategic agreement. These three high level policy reviews all have patients at the centre, and I think that's going to be a strong focus of our conversation today. How do we ensure that, our, that patients or healthy individuals don't become patients by ensuring timely access to important vaccines for public health? In the Medicines Australia Strategic Agreement, there are some significant goals. One of the shared goals is to reduce the time it takes for Australian patients to have access to new health technologies. The Therapeutic Goods Administration's position and role is to determine whether products are, have been manufactured to high quality standards and that they are safe and effective, that they meet the therapeutic claim that they're making. It is subsequent to that that there are decisions made on funding. And we have seen over the last several years that the time it takes between the Therapeutic Goods Administration determining that something is safe and effective and manufactured to high quality standards, and the time for the government to decide to fund something has been growing. It's been taking over 450 days on average, but in some cases up to several years before the government reaches a decision to fund something. That is partly because of the health technology assessment process, methodologies, and the underpinning policies. As a result, it has meant Australia is a less attractive country for companies to launch drugs early um, in this market because the time delay is a significant disincentive to bring medicines to Australia. On top of that, our processes and guidelines and practices have not kept pace with the rapid advances in science and technology. The things that we believe need to be improved we need to put patients at the centre of the process. The key goal is whether patients get access to the medicines they need when they need them. We need to consider new evaluation and funding pathways and be better at measuring value. What are the values not only um, in a health technology perspective, but what are the values to patients um, and what are the benefits to the economy that come out of um, providing early and fast access to new technologies? And ultimately, we must improve the time it takes to make those decisions. We've also um, elevated in our agreement the importance of the consumer voice. Consumers and clinicians, to be quite frank, need to be in involved earlier and more often in the engagement process around what is valuable, what is valuable to the economy, but what is valuable to the health profession, what is valuable to public health, and what is valuable to patients. And there is a, a large project being undertaken to co-design an enhanced consumer engagement process to bring patients and other stakeholders into the evaluation 
of medicines and new technologies earlier. There is also going to be an enhanced horizon scanning process to in inform that consumer engagement. In terms of vaccines, and, and that's why we're all here today, some of the assessment and policy um, methods that we think should be reformed is considering the second round effects. What are the broader economic benefits of providing access and broader access to vaccines? What are the benefits not only to the individual health outcome, but to the broader society? And how do they contribute to our broader economy? In terms of methodologies, uh, for those of you who um, are interested in some of the technical um, adjustments that are made in a health technology assessment, the discount rate is a significant barrier in terms of assessing the value of vaccines. The discount rate disadvantages those uh, products where the cost is upfront and the benefits accrue over a long period of time. In our view, the discount rate, particularly for vaccines, but for other products as well, should be reduced to a much lower percentage to 1.5% from the current 5% in order to reflect that focus on the preventative benefits of providing vaccines. And we also think that there is a lot of work to be done to streamline the processes, not not only the process for evaluation, uh, the processes for a target decision making, the processes for PBAC decision making, and then the subsequent processes for programmatic implementation. All of these things delay access to vaccines. And in the meantime, um, we are exposing our population to unnecessary risks and harms. This is a a uh, schematic of the vaccine assessment process, which shows where it is costly and inefficient and where the decision making um, uh, lets us all down. It is a very sequential process. There has to be an assessment um, provided by a TAGI. It's a very important process. Uh, a TAGI provides some advice to the PBAC. The PBAC conduct an evaluation. There is then a process for um, agreement of the price. And then there is a subsequent tender process across the states and territories um, and a, a subsequent government approval for that programmatic implementation. As you can see, the average time from TGA approval to an NIP listing is as much as 1,375 days. Now that's just unnecessary and unacceptable and something that needs to be resolved. <coughs> so, I can give you a, an opportunity to participate in this process and I'll let you know where we're up to um, and uh, what we're doing. The Health Technology Assessment Review commenced early this year in 2023 and is due to finish in December 2023. It's a 12 month review with a strong focus on reviewing the policy that underpins access to medicines, the methods uh, and technical evaluation um, processes, and then the actual process, whether they are sequential or parallel processes in the evaluation. The review has undertaken a systematic and academic review of other processes in other countries, looking at methodologies, policies, early access programs, um, and, and different scenarios that might be taken into account in, during this review. Those academic papers are now being published on the Department of Health website. They're, they're systematically getting published over the next couple of weeks. A first consultation process has was held up until June this year, and over 100 submissions were, were received, uh, providing some support and some advice to the committee and the government on what they think is important in health technology assessment. There were a range of stakeholders that contributed to that um, that, that first consultation, uh, including patients, clinicians, um, other stakeholders, the industry, peak bodies, um, and also the states and territories made their views known. There will be a second consultation. 
So at the moment, the committee is listening and hearing information from a number of stakeholders. There are some deep dive discussions being had, and there was a recent discussion around vaccines and also a discussion on the discount rate where we heard um, views from other stakeholders, including the industry and clinicians. And an options paper is, uh, is being developed at this very moment, which should be published in the next few weeks where we will be proposing as a committee what options should be considered in improving the time to access, the policies and the methodologies for assessing new medicines, new vaccines and new treatments. That options paper will open up the consultation number two. And this is an opportunity where you on the call can contribute to uh, the final uh, recommendations that we made by the committee to the government on how we can speed up and improve the processes for evaluation and access to new medicines. The kinds of inputs that are most useful to the review and the information that we have found is uh, found most useful is what are the examples? What are the examples of where patients have missed out or where harms have been ha you know, suffered because of the delays in access to new medicines or new vaccines or new technologies? And what are the possible solutions to these problems? What could be done to make it faster, better, more useful to our patients and our community? Now, we will be going into a couple of case studies. So I'm going to be handing over to our fantastic um, speakers today. Uh, Rod will be giving us a case study on the shingles example, as I said, and then um, Leanne will be giving us a case study on MEN-B. I'm going to stop sharing my slides now so that I can see the panelists um, and get our conversation started. So it's with great pleasure, I'd like to hand over to Rod, if you're ready. And, Thank you very um, much. Yep. And I look forward to hearing your example around shingles. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks for the great uh, introduction into an area that I guess as clinicians, we tend not to realise that all this work behind the scenes is actually uh, the way the system functions, but also um, maybe not always understanding what sort of input we can have to the uh, wills of government and the processes in Australia that make it so crucial for the uh, medications, for drugs, for vaccines to be made available. And um, I just, I love the... Uh, the actual document. It's a strategic, you sort of showed it before, um, doesn't show there, but the title is Strategic Agreement in Relation to Reimbursement, Health Technology Assessment and Other Matters. Um, so it's a fantastic because the other matters allows, I think, everyone to contribute. Um, and uh, I'd like to have an opportunity to discuss with you, as you said, the ways that we can provide input. But um, health technology, as you mentioned, is about um, maybe making sure of maximum uh, uh, adv uh, advances in technology and other matters um, whenever we see that there's a block in the rollout. So in this agreement, it acknowledges that PBAC makes recommendations uh, based on the assessment of effectiveness and cost. And it does um, talk about, as you've already mentioned, uh, to ensure Australian patients get access to rapid advances in modern and emerging technologies, therapy and vaccines. So the good thing about it is it recognises vaccines as a special, uh, a special category. And it's important to remember, having just come through COVID, that there's a whole lot of things that um, we need to address, be conscious of and take advantage of with vaccines. So I, I think vaccines have a special place. It's different than most drugs. And I'd just like to run through briefly an example, which um, I'll simplify a little bit and I'll just round off some of the figures, but take, for example, the Shingrix vaccine. Um, just been announced for the National Immunisation Program. There's still a few rough edges to iron out as we introduce it, but it's two injections, two months apart. So uh, it's uh, approximately $500 to buy uh, the vaccine and there's two encounters um, by providers to give it. The benefit we estimate is gonna last about 12 years. If you take a, a cholesterol tablet, a statin, it's gotta be taken daily. It's prescribed now yearly, but it was twice a year, it had to be prescribed. 
You need to monitor the effectiveness. You need to titrate the dose. So if it costs you $240 a year for your 12-year benefit, you're spending close to $3,000 at least plus the cost. And the number of needed to treat is about 400. So looking at vaccines the same way as you look at a medication, in my mind, just doesn't add up. And the other thing that, that all of us who've been watching this particular space is that we waited 12 years because we actually have 12 year data now on the effectiveness of this vaccine. And one of the delays seems, that seems to happen is that uh, we get asked, uh, what's the five year benefit? What's the 10 year benefit? What's the data you've got? And bringing that into the system where we can actually recognize the benefits, it just doesn't make sense to wait 12 years before you say, oh yeah, this works for 10 years or more. So let's actually consider it. And one of the other examples, um, and I was actually on ATAGI when uh, PBAC was asked to review ATAGI's decisions. And uh, as Liz has said, is that ATAGI makes a recommendation. Once the recommendation's made, then ATAGI then has to put together a special case to go to PBAC so they can consider it. It gets passed backwards and forwards. And then after that, there can still be another two or three years before it's actually introduced into the program. So even though the expert body is recommending it, Australia lags behind in its process. When HPV uh, vaccine was introduced into Australia, we had four um, strains. And um, one of the options and negotiations were, was that we would introduce it up to the age of 26. But if it was found that five years later we needed a top up, rather than waiting another five years for the data, uh, rather than waiting to the information to realise we could just use one vaccine and waiting until we had a nine strain vaccine, we went ahead with our four strains and one of the first countries in the world to actually eliminate cervical cancer because we were brave enough to introduce a vaccine. We saw the benefit um, of introducing it first with women up to the age of 26. And then later we introduced it to men and we had provisos that if we needed a booster, that would be built into the cost and a strategy to actually deal with it. So we've got a system that's good on paper and it's having to be cobbled together because different vaccines create different challenges and they create um, a different uh, environment. And the system is no longer flexible enough to actually account for that. One of the other things that we adopted in this process that we were discounting 5% um, for vaccines, which was based on Canada's uh, uh, program at the time. And we are now one of the most heavily discounted uh, OECD countries when we devalued vaccines. So someone gets a vaccine today and its value in 10 years time is discounted more than any other country in the world. So Canada's reduced its discount rate, um, but we're still devaluing it, even though that individual is getting the benefit straight away and the system doesn't have to add any more for an example such as the shingles the shingrix vaccine and uh, the system has been cobbled together as all these exceptions and different examples uh, are occurring and we've got multiple adjustments we've got multiple exceptions and that is now um, instead of a well-oiled machine we've now got a, a ramshackled it will do patchwork type arrangement where we're having to roughly guess or invent a new program every time it's being done. So what was working for us um, helped us be a leader and introduce some of the vaccines and, and show the world how it's done. It's now starting to be an impediment to the introduction of, of vaccines. And with COVID, we've seen the mRNA technology advance really quickly. And for us to keep on using it, um, we hope to be manufacturing it here. And for us to still be able to introduce um, the um, uh, new vaccines as we develop them and, and trial them it has to be something that becomes uh, quicker and more streamlined. And the other thing that, that um, is kind of a good and a bad, but certainly an important talking point, PBAC might make an adjustment and say um, a daily, the, uh, daily uh, adjusted life for years might be 15,000 or it might be 200,000. So the discretion is good because PBAC can have a discretion between some value of some drugs and some um, uh, vaccines, but it varies so much that it's almost become a, oh, let's make it up this time rather than something that makes it predictable for someone to actually judge what, what value. Liz has already outlined also broadening the scope of what benefit. Um, and we're seeing with whooping cough that when a, an elderly person gets a, a whooping cough vaccine, 
uh, their kids um, improved and their grandchildren are protected and being able to budget that. But Australia rejected the cocooning for the whooping cough vaccine, even though places like America thought it was of value. So we haven't quite got it right. So um, we need to be able to introduce vaccines and we need to be able to introduce good vaccines. We need to have a way that everyone can predict. We shouldn't be um, uh, having the delay once it's accepted by PBAC with a, a target recommendation and still take another two to three years. And it shouldn't have to cost us three, four hundred thousand dollars just to put an application in for a variant. And again, the Immunisation Coalition has put submissions in to say, can we have free black vaccines for people over 50? Um, and each submission we've got to make is going to cost us two hundred thousand dollars. So it shouldn't be that complicated. So we've got to change the system. And um, we think vaccines have a unique place. And so we need mechanism to recognise that and to give Australia the benefit as per this agreement, which recognises that should be something for Australians. So that's where I'd like to start, but thanks, Liz. Um, and I'll be interested in, in questions and further discussions. Thank you. Thanks, Rod. And, and I think um, I'd love to go to Leanne next and then we can have a group conversation. But I just wanted to say that really the thing you're talking about is value for money, um, the value for money assessment um, and, and the fact that we undervalue the value we get from vaccines. I think that's key. Um, so thanks, Rod. Stay there. And um, I'm going to hand us over to the lovely Dr. Leanne Jones, who's going to give us her example around the meningococcal B vaccine, which is another you know, test case of what's going wrong. Thank you, Liz. And thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight to hear about this. Meningococcal disease, as we know, is very rare, but it's really devastating. And you know, that while there might have been 200 cases in 2019 in Australia and 125 last year, and numbers for this year are yet to be sort of in as we're only into October, it has a really high fatality rate. One in 10 cases will result in death. And survive. You know, those who survive are not left unscathed with, they say, one in five with some sort of complication such as loss of limb or hearing loss um, and even up to 30 percent have something you know whether it be anxiety um, maybe some sort of learning difficulty those sorts of things and you know that's where we're in that problem we've got a rare disease but we've got a disease that's devastating and one of the things that's come apparent over the years I've been in general practice as we said earlier over 35 years and as a hospital resident, I did see cases of meningococcal disease and you know, they were not nice, And but those children were sick and you never forget one if you've seen it. The GPs now and the hospital interns probably never see a case, so they really don't know what they're on the lookout for. And we've got this situation where within 12 hours you can go from a healthy child to a seriously ill child and be dead in 24 hours, which is one of those really scary things and we've now also got a situation in healthcare where people are reluctant to go to our emergency departments because we're there told they're over you know, they're ramping they're full they can't you know, don't go near emergency you'll be sitting in the waiting room um, gp practices are busy and you know people have now since covid have been discouraged going to gp practices if they've got a fever um, stay home have a telehealth this sort of thing so we've got this situation where there's great risk of actually missing these children with meningococcal disease. And so we need to have to protect them as much as we can and know that we have an effective vaccine that prevents that. We saw that with the introduction of the NC in around 2000, suddenly a number of cases plummeted, why our doctors don't see as many cases. Then that caused the rise of the um, you know, the W strain, and so then we got the ACWY in 2019. So most of the strains coming to now are the meningococcal B strain, and we, we have a really good vaccine for that. Um, and it's a vaccine that isn't necessarily cheap for people to buy on the private market, and so there is that anxiety about should I spend that money on it for my child? There's the anxiety of the parents of what do I miss my child's got meningococcal disease? GP anxiety, we can't put, have to put dollars on them. We can put dollars on how much it costs to go to hospital, how much it costs to have rehab, AIDS, special education. Um, but, you know, and we have these now. We've got this almost a sort of 
and them and us because we do have some you know, Atari have said it is an important vaccine and it's a vaccine that we should be as GPs offering to all our children that come through and telling them that and that's what I call it recommended but it's funded only for small groups um, it's funded for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children which is really great and it's funded in some states so some of our states have seen that value and is it fair if you live on the new you live you know on the border in Victoria right next to South Australia and the South Australian children are getting it you know across the border and you what's different in your you know makeup of your community you should be probably at just as great a risk um, you know, um we're saying that ATSI children are at risk because of their health issues that we know are, are very major in that group but you know there's also overcrowding and poverty in people who don't have an ATSI background and who would definitely really be struggling to afford a private vaccine. So, you know, how long do we have to wait for a vaccine that we know works? And we know that on the pipeline, it's an, um, AC, ABCWY, and are we going to be put out to do that for as long? Um, you know, in the UK, they've had meningococcal B vaccine for children for a long time. Uh, we, they had the C long before we did. Um, these are countries which surely we should trust how they do their research and use some you know, use some of the information they've provided rather than having to go and seek, seek our own vaccinations. So that's where I see it as a sort of problem. Why why can't we introduce vaccines that other countries are using? Thanks, Leanne. And um, you know, I I was recently speaking to one of the virologists in South Australia <laughs> who um, was instrumental in advocating for the program there. And she said to me, you know, you should still get your adolescent, young adult children vaccinated even now as the mother of a 20 year old and a 23 year old. She said up to 25, go get them vaccinated if you can. Um, at which time my beautiful 20 year old daughter was in university when there was an outbreak of meningococcal B. So, you know, she's in a prime kind of high risk setting um, with no protection. And, uh, you know, like you, um, from from my perspective, you know, I, why aren't we providing it uh, universally to our young um, young adolescents and, and doing a catch up program for those people who have missed out in childhood. So we have seen um, New South Wales. I think is it New South Wales that's just funded? Did you say Queensland? Funded just Queensland. Oh, Queensland. 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 Yeah. So we have got two states that have now funded meningococcal. So they have done their own um, some form of value assessment on whether it's it's a, a value for money question. So it is worth the conversation. Um, I'm looking, nobody's sent any questions through right now, so all of you are online. I'm going to ask um, uh, Rod and Leanne a couple of things and, and get the conversation started, but please do ask your questions um, in the Q&A function um, or, and uh, let us know what you're thinking. Uh, even if you just have a comment to make on, on uh, your particular experiences or examples that you've got or things that you'd like to know more about, just let us know in that Q&A. So, I was thinking, uh, Rod, in terms of the uh, ATAGI processes and having been a member of ATAGI, um, one of the things that has uh, been highly valuable over the years has been the epidemiological reports or the, or the, the reports that, are, uh, that the NCIRS do, where they actually look at what are the, the um, sort of horizon scanning, uh, what functions. Does ATAGI have a role in sort of horizon scanning what vaccines might be out in the pipeline and, and preempting those applications that may come from, um, from sponsors? There's, there's a couple of uh, things that, that happen. So ATAGI is on top of most of the issues by looking at the pipeline. There is an opportunity for most companies to present to ATAGI what they're planning, what they think will be in Australia and then the challenge for a target is to look at the epidemiology behind it and say, right, this is going to be fantastic for Australia to have this particular uh, vaccine. And then the frustration, but limitation and interesting sort of area from this goes that if a target thinks it's fantastic, 
uh, will it become something that's available on the National Immunisation Program? And Australia's got this slight anomaly where if it's recommended by a target, it may not necessarily end up as a funded vaccine. And I certainly understand and um, members of ATAGI understand and NCRS that does reports and the epidemiology understand that just because it's a good vaccine doesn't mean the government automatically funds it. And once upon a time, once ATAGI recommended, so we go back 30 years, it automatically got funded. And then the government says, hang on, this is getting a bit expensive because we've got this expert body recommending something and we've got to find the money. So to put a system in place to manage that, uh, it was invented uh, in the uh, mid-2000s, that PBAC would review it. Now, the good thing about that is that it provided a bit of certainty because it's PBAC. The bad thing about, from our point of view, was that it was evaluating vaccines the same way as it was evaluating drugs. And so the anomalies there um, started off uh, small but then got bigger. But at the time we changed to flu vaccines from a prescription to a national immunisation program because it seemed silly to write a script uh, go to the chemist and then take it back to the GP and do it. So all of those sort of things were changed because people saw the advantage of streamlining the system and making vaccines more efficient. But it still ended up that we had to add things onto the PBAC system to see whether the vaccine was appropriate. And that's where, in my mind, we started add-ons. We started making um, descriptions that were, you know, for this particular one, it's an exception, or this one's a unique situation. Like every drug's unique, every uh, vaccine is probably got its unique place. And when you try to make exceptions into a system that looks smooth, well oiled, and predictable, you start to bolt on attachments to the process that have mm. ended us um, in in the place where it's cumbersome and unpredictable. And it's so, about so, knocking so... those barnacles off now, I think. Yeah, so Rod, if you had a magic wand, what what would you change? What would be different? How would you do it? It, uh, in my mind, it changes to a system that puts vaccines separate, and there's a separate process, call it the PBACV or something, that looks at vaccines and finds that special place. Um, now, I guess uh, monoclonal antibodies that are now part of our um, treatment programs for a lot of diseases. Maybe someone says, well, make a special place for them or make a special place for biologicals or make a special place. But um, vaccines are always and vaccines. And in this agreement, it mentions and vaccines. And the revolution Sorry. of COVID has just given us a chance to and vaccines. So I think um, vaccines do have a special place. And the unique preventative medicine program um, is so different from what Medicare and a whole lot of our systems about treating the diseases that we've got in front of us. And it's like we've got to change to prevention rather than uh, intervention. And so I actually think there's a unique place. So that's my magic wand. But the reality is, is to go between where we are now and into those sort of improvements. So there's a couple of things coming through on the question, and I'm not sure who this will be addressed to. Is there any scope to be able to look at the costs of older vaccines that are linked to NNP prices? There seems to be no pathway to seek an increase in price with increasing cost of goods. Um, I'm not sure I know the answer to that one. I, th I think that um, one of the things we do see with other medicines is that the pricing is very much linked to older medicines and that... Um, that's it's the non-inferior in um, criteria? Is that what you're talking about? Well, either, yes. I mean, well, certainly, no. All medicines are compared to their lowest cost comparator. Uh, the sponsor then has to demonstrate whether it is an equivalent health outcome, which is no added therapeutic value, same price as the lowest cost comparator, or demonstrate cost effectiveness above. So either an improvement in efficacy or a reduction in toxicity yeah. in order to get a higher price than the and that, And that's one of the challenges um, with some of the new technology with flu vaccines. Some of the new vaccines that give us uh, uh, H3N1 um, look, the, the vaccines, different technology. Uh, when we had in Australia, high dose versus adjuvanted uh, vaccines for over 65, the question was, it's better and everyone says yes it's better but how much better is it and is it non-inferior and to make those comparisons it became really difficult so um and then when we add an extra valency like uh, we had a three valent um on a four uh hpv when it started then we went to seven now we've got nine 
each of that incremental improvement. But if we can't get support for that without having to go through the whole process as if it's a new vaccine, it just creates barriers where there's a natural improvement. And probably the next big challenge, and Leanne might want to comment here, is uh, probably with pneumococcal uh, vaccines. We've gone from a 23, but maybe not as effective, to a uh, 7, a lot more effective, but less uh, um, uh, okay. types. And then we're going to increase that to probably 20. So how do we get those incremental improvements into Australia right? rather than waiting till we got such a big jump that everyone says, yeah, we're definitely better rather than a 2% improvement, a 3% improvement, 5% improvement. Yeah. And how do you compare apples and oranges? Because you're comparing different things there, aren't you? So Leanne, did you have a comment on on uh, on that particular one? And then I have another one for you. <laughs> um, probably, I mean, just agreeing with that, that, you know, really once you've proved that a vaccine is, you know, those incremental improvements are just like refinements, you know, you don't have to start the whole process over again. With those, those incremental, it should just be given as a better of the same comes out. We should just go. So Bruce um, has said, bravo, Leanne, spot on. Uh, we're working state by state with families for MEMB. Um, we were in Queensland success and currently working with New South Wales and Victoria. Watch this space. And that's Bruce from the Meningitis Centre uh, Australia in Perth. So that sounds to me, Bruce, like you're looking um, that we're seeing that state by state adoption of meningococcal B might be the only way we can get access to it for our um, patients and families. Uh, Leanne, what do you, what say you to that? I just say that's really disappointing. Australia is a whole and we all are Australians and we should all be in this together. And you know, I'm grateful to Bruce and his organisation for trying to, chipping away at that, but you know, and I also know that states have budgets. Um, you know, they only have so much money for vaccine and it's hard for them to add in extra ones. So then you take little states like us little guys in Tasmania. What hope are we probably ever of getting it on the schedule? Um, we didn't do knee jerk stuff. We, you know, we put in an ACWY program before anyone else did because we had an exceptional um, case rate, but you know, this is, this is your problem, whereas if you actually have it as Australia-wide and, you know, sometimes I think Australia should just have one health system across Australia and then we can all be consistent. Yeah. Thanks, Leanne. Sure. And uh, Richard has said, if a target is national and so is the PBAC and I get epidemiology, but why state-based approaches? Um, and I, those who can travel can get, you know, you can get it from one state, but not another. I'm, I might make a, a, a stab at that because I think that, you know, we we do have uh, the PBAC, which is a national program, but the PBAC can only recommend drugs to be listed on the pharmaceutical benefits scheme. If it doesn't go on the pharmaceutical benefits scheme, then it has to be funded in some other way. So even when the PBAC recommend a vaccine, they recommend it can go on the NIP um, and that, that's their only other leeway. Uh, then, uh, then there has to be state-based um, programmatic approaches to how will that be implemented at a state level. And Leanne's exactly right. Um, there is still some contention on funding between the states and territories and the Commonwealth government. And this is one of the barriers to access for a number of things, um, not just vaccines, not just different ways of implementing the NIP, not just um, doing state-based assessments of the value for money of, of individual vaccines like MEMB, but also we see that on with those advances in new technologies, where the actual delivery of a technology may be across a state-based system, even if the drug is funded federally. So we've seen that with the cell and gene therapies. So this is one of the uh, incentives for the HTA review is that our system is changing, technologies are changing, and we should have a national system that actually delivers for all of Australians rather than um, breaking it up into those state-based areas. So um, that's my view on that. Does anyone else have any comments on whether we should be funding things nationally or whether it is appropriate to fund things on a state-by-state -state basis? I'm unsure, right. Leanne or Rod, you know, the NIP seems to work very well, so state-based funding might well, be actually a, a good I, um, Well done, Bruce, for his work, and thank you for that. But the, the sadness of it is that 
it needs that one-on-one uh, -on -one advocacy. And we'd like to think we've got a system in Australia that looks after us without us having to go into battle. But um, one of the reasons I'm involved in medical politics is that it seems without uh, specific advocacy, uh, good policy can be overturned by bad politics. Occasionally you get wins with politics because uh, suddenly Queensland announced the flu vaccine was free and then the other countries. ACWY was uh, announced uh, state by state and then the Commonwealth uh, uh, led in. Uh, the HPV vaccine, um, we went to 26. We weren't expecting it that old um, and it was good to have it for an older population when it first started. The Men C vaccine, we didn't expect to be in the teenagers. We expect to be children, but we were delighted that it, when it came in, uh, probably through a political either mistake or an opportunity, um, we had it. So, but um, I guess what what I'm looking for, and I think Liz, what what this agreement uh, for um, vaccines and everything is that I think that everything or in anything, I think, and other matters. Um, for the uh, uh, other matters is about let's get some logic and some consistency and more predictability about the process. And unless people actually come up with examples or anomalies, we just end up with a system that isn't working as well as we think it could. And if we can streamline it and introduce uh, programs that have more logic and there's a national and a sensible national approach to it, it's going to be better for everything. So I think that that's the opportunity. But at the moment, we've got uh, political lobbying, we've got um, advocacy, we've got uh, discussion with the states to maybe push it forward. And um, um, I guess that's one of the the options we've got, but now an opportunity to review it centrally, uh, put uh, put that best step forward, and um, see if we can make some mileage that makes everyone better. And then probably just as a slightly different but a similar uh, complaint about Australia is that we have the funded programs, and I'm grateful for that, and I think it's good. We have a national immunisation program, but why not have extra support or a system that says, look, it's a vaccine that's recommended by a target and recognising the value of that expert advisory group and let the government openly acknowledge that it's not going to fund everything and have a system that works together with patients, their private health and the states to say the Commonwealth isn't funding it, but it's still a good vaccine. It's still recommended by the expert group and have public acknowledgement and support for the vaccines because as Bruce would know, is that some people forget that men B is one of the vaccines they should have. They say, I've got my vaccines according to the National Immunisation Program. Ha, ah, but you probably missed one because the NIP doesn't cover all of them. So there is a, a hole in Australia's broad strategy where we recommend vaccines, but we don't fund them, but there's no open acknowledgement that the two systems should work together. So I think that's a bit of a hole in the way it's rolled out. But if we can streamline and make predictable and reduce the costs of, of getting world's best practice through this strategy, then I think we should be looking at um, uh, helping this HTA agreement and, and um, talking to it and, and lobbying and working with um, the, the, the uh, body who's on it. Um, I, um, thanks, and uh, Leanne, I, I just wanted to sort of uh, draw you into this conversation as well. That in terms of there's a number of people on the line who are immunization providers. Um, traditionally, our providers have been GPs um, or nurse practitioners. We saw during COVID, we expanded that. Um, obviously, pharmacists are now uh, are vaccine providers as well. There's a lot of discussion around um, scope of practice. And do you think having more people who can provide vaccines is part of the problem? Or is it actually the the um, bottlenecks in actually getting the vaccines that's the problem? I think we, the more people that can provide vaccines, the better. I mean, we want to have as many people vaccinated as possible, so providing opportunities for them. And I think we saw that when um, it was opened up. It had been opened up with influenza, but it was opened Hopefully, up yeah. with the COVID vaccine because we had <clears throat> a population that had to be back, you know, a large number of people quickly vaccinated. And I think um, increasing the number of providers can only be beneficial rather than, and, you know, it'll be so the same vaccines and people are not going to double up and get the vaccines. Um, so it's not going to increase costs to the system. And it may actually decrease some of the costs of the system by having these other opportunities. To, and the, so should, um, we, should, we use, should we use those broader vaccine providers, um, the GPs, the nurse practitioners and, and even pharmacists to have a say in the decision-making about um, where the vaccine should be funded? 
I think that's quite reasonable and they should be advocating for those things as well. And we've they all end up on air now, so that's really great. So we can actually see where, where people are getting vaccines and that they've had them. And one of the great things about Australia is that the Child Immunisation Register was set up in the 90s. That we got 90% in three years. So Australia led the world and continues to lead the world in childhood vaccines. And after that, uh, the challenge was to bring adult vaccines up to the same sort of numbers. And we've had the Australian Immunisation Register, which has moved from just childhood to all uh, vaccines uh, since 2016-17. So we've got the denominator or the numerator, which, whichever you like, but we've got the potential to actually know who's been vaccinated. Now we need to, to bring together the vaccines we've got. We need an educated discussion around which are the good vaccines and we need some way of valuing them so that uh, every new improvement um, is actually translated into an opportunity for consumers. And I think, um, as I mentioned before, open discussion by the government to say, look, we acknowledge that everyone's pathway is different. As an adult, you may have had a, um, a different number of vaccines or different times, but um, a good vaccine is a good vaccine. And for Australians not to have the attitude just because it's recommended but not funded, uh, I'm not going to have it. So there's some work to do, get the um, sort of thoughts right. But I think this process of actually saying, at least when a vaccine arrives, the company presenting it, uh, the people reviewing it, and the National Immunisation Program can be comfortable that it's going to arrive on their desk to consider in an appropriate and uh, a time that, that's useful to keep Australia on the forefront of, of the vaccines that are available in the world. Thank you. I think that's a. I think that's a great. I think that's a great proposal. I write that one down. Send it off to the HGO review. I, I. I think that um, the other thing I'd like to sort of talk about a little bit is the influence of the community. So one of the things we've we've looked very much at. You know what makes a politician do something? What makes the government um, do something? And they are very motivated by their constituency. They're very motivated by um, people. Make the people make me do it. You know what? What? Um, what do? What do patients? So patient stories resonate when people are missing out. Um, and I was at a, a dinner with a um, with a minister um, and a, a patient was telling or a, a lady was telling the story about her tragic case of her her son who died um of meningococcal B um and was not vaccinated. The the overarching point that came through to me was the lack of awareness and the lack of understanding. So how can our community advocate and make politicians do something if they don't even know what they're missing out on? And one of the things we've also established is who do people listen to? Who do the community trust? It's you. It's our doctors. So what is the role of our GPs to educate our community about what they're missing out on so that they can mobilise our community to, to motivate our, our politicians to change things? And, and how much you know, do you provide in terms of education around vaccines that aren't available because it is such an emotive subject? Or do you only educate your community around the vaccines that are available? And do you have views on that? And that's to both of you. I think it's very important about educating people on what, what is available, funded or not funded, and explaining that, you know, there is this recommended. And, yes, and you know, I often will talk to people about it and say, you know, if we had a perfect world, we could afford, the government could afford these, but the government unfortunately, isn't a bottomless pit either. It's had to spend a lot of money, um, particularly recently on COVID vaccination, which has been really good that they've provided that vaccine. So you know, these, you know, in, in a wish list, and we have to some degree in the last week got that wish list with the shingles vaccine for a bigger group than we thought it was going to be funded. So I think and, and, have to... Uh, yeah, um, I think it's important for all providers and anyone in the community to have an experience to talk about it so that uh, there is a discussion. Uh, I think we're all a little bit shell-shocked after COVID and the, um, some feelings um, in the community, but uh, most doctors, uh, are chemists, nurses who are um, giving vaccines uh, are comfortable to talk about it. Um, we're a little bit burnt out, like I said, because of the experience. But the Immunisation Coalition has uh, looked forward and felt that it's important to have a lot of literacy about what vaccines are, how they work, their safety, their risks, what the immune system is, how it works, how it fights off infection. So through that, we've 
um, established a school based and a learning program through one of our uh, board members who's been working on this for, for a few years to make modules on uh, literacy about what the immune system is, how vaccines work. And it's about hoping that the next generation, when there is a pandemic or up, if there are new vaccines, the community actually understands it, that school children will learn about uh, immune systems, not as something horrible and social media is talking to them about as an ogre and how poisons are coming into their system, but that the immune system has been protecting us for a, a long time and we can use it to boost our immune system. So the Immunisation Coalition certainly it's keen to make sure there's community awareness of what the immune system is, how it works, and where vaccines are in that system. And that's, I guess, because we think the vaccines have a special place. And um, when I was in Oxford just recently talking to some of the people there and some of the professors saying, look, it's going to be interesting. It's all about our immune system. Maybe all these diseases are going to be fixed by us fixing our immune system. So um, the world's changing. We've got to value it for what it is. We've got to understand the value of, of some of the new programs and new vaccines and um, got to make sure we're all there on the front page and make sure Australia doesn't miss out. Yes, thanks. Uh, you raise a really good point about the immune system. And, um, you know, many, many um, older clinicians I've spoken to when they did their medical training, immunology was a very short module. And, and now, of course, it's a specialty that is vast and, and continuing to grow. There's a lot of talk about... Um, uh, vaccines for non-communicable diseases. So do you think that that's where your vaccine expertise is going to have to go? And and will we start looking at vaccines from a broader public health perspective? Uh, I, I think so. I think the HPV was a great example where the vaccine um, has removed the virus that causes irritation that causes the, the tumour. And as we understand more about the immune system, then um, I think that's going to be the challenge. And as you said, the simple concepts about uh, IgG, IgM, um, immunity and all that sort of stuff, far more complicated. COVID's uh, helped us learn lots. Uh, HIV has helped us learn lots about the immune system. So um, the immune system isn't just about uh, coming in contact with an antigen and then being protected for all our life. It's actually far more interesting and complicated. But yeah, great opportunity and um, it's an exciting area. And the uh, um, the Immunisation Coalition uh, program is called Amiga, and um, it is available and I think it's accessible through our websites and we just launched that this year. So that's about uh, um, having an opportunity to help our community understand the beginning of where the immune system works. That's fantastic. Thank you, Rod. We'll certainly send that information out after the session tonight. And I think to bring it back to the Health Technology Assessment Review, um, one of the most important things in our value for, for money assessment is what are the not only the costs of, of providing a treatment, but what are the benefits or what are the savings that are, provide, are, are de derived from providing a treatment? And I think we can, particularly with vaccines, try and do a better job of trying to quantify what are the benefits of an illness avoided or what are the benefits of a tragedy avoided and what are the costs of not avoiding that that those illnesses um, and those kind of examples will certainly inform the health technology assessment review um, and I think that um, the role of ATAGI and the role of groups like the Immunisation Coalition will become more and more important in decision making. I'm just going to, we've only got a couple of minutes left so I just want to open the mic to you both. Um, are there any last remarks that you'd like to make? Um, a couple of people have left. Um, Thank you. I see the IC education is called Amiga. Will be be able to access the modules for school children is a question. That's um, the Elizabeth that's the plan. has responded. Yes, that's and, the plan. Uh, um, and um, and that's uh, it. Open to you for final remarks. Yeah, and and um, from what I understand is the the committee that's looking at it, in which you're a member, um, you'll have options and um, chances for people to contribute to later this year, as you said, in, and then early into next year when there's option page, 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 papers. Produce. So um, thank you for your work um, and let's uh, uh, encourage people to make their um, views known so that we can um, work with you and the government to improve Australia's um, assessment of vaccines. Thank you. Leanne? Yeah, and I just echo what Rod, Rod said that, you know, this is an opportunity we've got and um, I'm guessing we're going to get some information about how to make submissions. 
they should be set. We will send around the links to the website, but there will be an options paper out by um, end of November. Uh, consultation will run until uh, until next year. Um, there is uh, expectation that any changes that are a cost to the government will be ready for the next budget. So we should start to see some changes shortly after that. That's my goal. Um, thank you both. Thank you, Leanne. Thank you, Rod. Uh, this brings us to the end of our webinar and on behalf of all of us here i'd like to thank you for joining us and for your input and for your questions there's lots of interesting discussion um i'd like to make special thanks to my two panel members dr rodney pierce and dr leanne jones for your examples your insights your expertise and your support for this process we value everyone's feedback so please let us know what you thought of the activity fill out the evaluation form which has been sent to you to your email address and thank you all very much for attending and good night.